Kilian. Hi. Hi. Can you please turn on the video? Yes, I'm here. Perfect. Nice background. I want to introduce our guest today is Liam. Uh, Liam is a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he is the founder of staff.com, timedoctor.com, and he's the founder of Brain Remote Conference. Is that correct, Liam? That is yeah. correct. Yeah, and moreover, Liam is a one one remote uh, advocate. So it's the person who started remote more than 10 years ago. And he is like really famous in the remote world. So I want to start actually with, uh, uh, as I mentioned, you're the founder of staff.com, timedoctor.com and run remote conference. And mm -hmm. I, I want to start from the beginning. So as far as I understood, the first company was staff.com. Is that correct? No, it was actually timedoctor.com. It came out of me being in grad school and I was running a tutoring company that was remote. And the problem that I had was I couldn't equate for how long a tutor worked with a student. And then I would end up having students that would ask for refunds on build time with tutors. So Time Doctor was born out of that to be able to measure how long a tutor worked with a student when they worked remotely. And that just pulled into a whole bunch of different verticals, particularly in the remote workspace. Cool, super. So I will start with it, start my questions with the timedoctor.com. So sure. it was established in 2000, it's a, uh, I just want to mention it's a founder for founder standup. So I, I will mostly ask like business questions. And if you can share right. your experience, it would be great. Maybe it would help someone, uh, help our listeners. So uh, Time Doctor was established as, as far as I know in 2012. And by the time it yes. was Togo on the scene from 2006, Rescue Time from 2008, and Hubstaff from 2011. So you basically mm. entered where mature market. What did you do then? Mm. So uh, boy, yeah, that, I never really thought of it in, in that context. Um, uh, we're bigger than all those companies now. <laughs> so, I mean, I think there was an opportunity to kind of see where that space was and, and recognize that there was a solution um, that we could that we could really work on. But uh, I think that all markets now are honestly mature. I think that like even when we're talking about remote work, which is something that is going to be like we've just had a nuclear bomb go off in terms of the remote workspace. We've gone from 4% in 2018 of Americans working full-time remotely, quote unquote, to by our estimates, 60% of the month of April. So complete shift. Uh, a whole bunch of people would probably tell you it would be crazy to get into the remote workspace because it was already a, you know, a, a mature market before COVID happened. But now it's a completely new game and there's so many other things that are out there that I think are just popping up that are going to be very exciting. So I think if there is already some companies making money inside of your market, your total addressable market, your TAM, that's great because that means that there's, there's room for you. Um, at the end of the day, we really don't pay attention to most of our competitors as well. So also figuring out a very clear niche of what you want to offer inside of that market, I think is, is very important. So we always focused on basically agencies that were working with um, remote workers. That was really our, our core customer. And we knew that we could build a good solid eight figure business inside of that market. Maybe not a billion dollar company, but it's definitely something that it could get us to the point in which we're operational, we're functional, we have a good size team, and then we can expand out into other products. So competition, I don't think is something that you should be too scared about. And if anything, actually, I think you shouldn't pay attention to. Good point. Uh, and your company totally bootstrapped. I've checked your crunch based pro profile, no investments by the date. Mm -hmm. Correct. How did you do that? So basically it's interesting because when I researched Togo is bootstrapped as well, uh, Rescue Time as well, and Hub Stuff as well. So no investment when they launched. So it's, it's mm. super strange. Like 
companies in the same field just build the business from scratch. How, how did you find money for that? Yeah, that was tier one of SaaS, right? So the, I would say you really can't do that today, at least to the same degree. Um, and I'll say, uh, well, I don't want to kind of, there might be people on the call right now that would disagree with me, but it's a lot harder to be able to acquire customers now than in 2012. Uh, like I could buy a customer for probably one tenth of the cost on a Facebook ad that I can today. And that early acquisition was really great to be able to get us to a point in which we built a mini brand and then people would pay attention to us and we would just, uh, the majority of our business is really through referrals at this point and through product marketing. So uh, it's, um, you could bootstrap at that point. I would say if you were to build the same type of company that we, we've currently built now, very difficult to do it without at least half a million, a million bucks. And to be able to say that we're entirely bootstrapped is a little bit disingenuous because both me and Rob both had capital to be able to invest. So we had um, probably invested about $100,000 into the business to be able to get it operational and at least make it cash neutral. I've listened to your interview about SaaS business and uh, during that it was actually not interview, it was just a video. And you told that uh, you've been on a free beta for almost nine months, from eight to nine months. And I believe you have spent some time building the product, so about three or four or five months, I'm not sure. So for 12 months, uh, you, you, you didn't get money at all. Is that correct? Yeah, horrible mistake. Bad mistake. Don't do that under any circumstances whatsoever. We got the wrong feedback. The reason why I would suggest that no one have a free beta is because you'll get feedback, but it will bring you in the opposite direction from the feedback that you want. What you really want is hate mail. You want people to email you saying, I hate your product and I'm unsubscribing from your product. Please give me a refund. And then once you get that email, ask them why and just give them back all of their money, do whatever it takes to be able to get the feedback because that's what you critically need. With a free beta, You'll have a whole bunch of people that will use it, but then no one will actually giving you, give you meaningful feedback because they won't use it passionately. When someone is paying for something, that's, that's when they'll, they'll give you meaningful feedback, uh, which was a lesson that I had to unfortunately learn the hard way. So basically you have spent like your own money for almost a year or more than a year. And then you decided to switch to the paid version and then you understood where to develop, how to develop the product. Yeah. So uh, when we had, we had, I believe we made 6,000 MRR the first month that we went from free to paid and MRR is just monthly recurring revenue for anyone that's not in the SaaS space. And so we had, um, at that point, we were very scared that we were going to lose all of the customer feedback that we were generating from the free product. But ironically, what ended up happening is our hours tracked metric uh, tripled. So we had basically people using the product three times as much as pre-beta, even though we had less than 10% of our customers that went to paid from the free product. That's a really important insight. Usage is more important than users. And I think that that's something that a lot of people just don't pay attention to, at least at the beginning. They think to themselves, well, yeah, we have 100,000 users on our system. I'd rather have 1,000 paid users than 100,000 free users, personally. They, they just give you better feedback. It's interesting. You, you have mentioned $6,000 on the first month. And the average check is, it should be small, around 10, or, or, or what was the average check? Oh, um, I think the average seat count at that point was probably three people, so approximately $30 per user or per company per month. So 200, so small companies. 200 yeah. companies subscribed on the first month. Yeah, I think we had, we had thousands of companies that were using us for free. And the fear was that we were going to lose all of them when in reality, actually. So what I would suggest that you do, if you're going to build 
product now is tell people, I'm going to pay you a dollar, pay me a dollar for the free beta. Just whatever the minimum amount of money, but they must open up their wallet. So give me a dollar and I will give you free beta access for the next six months. As an example, you'll get that feedback and you'll get people that will stop using it. And that's what will just do whatever you need to do to be able to trigger the hate mail. Um, that's another thing that we do inside of the company as well. For anyone that uses Time Doctor, <laughs> I apologize for this, but you'll kind of understand. Uh, we will remove features randomly from the software simply to measure how many people send us hate mail and support. So if we have a feature like we used to have a project management feature inside of Time Doctor and we didn't remove the feature, but we removed access on our toolbar for that feature. So we just deleted that link on our UI and we measured how many people would send us really angry letters saying, hey, what happened to this feature? And we got six emails out of 6,000 clients. <laughs> so we realized, oh, this is not something that we should invest more energy into because People say, like, if you give someone, if you ask someone for a, a feature edition, everyone will say, yes, they want it. No one will say, like, if I said, I would uh, like to add a purple elephant icon optimizer in the top left-hand corner of my UI, people will say, oh, that sounds good. Yeah, I'll have that. But how many people are willing to pay for it and how many people are actually going to use it effectively to be able to either expand your revenue or reduce your churn rate. That's what you need to be able to focus on. So randomly removing those features and getting that emotional state from people saying, why did you take this feature? I was using it every day is absolutely critical in my opinion. Wow. Well, it's interesting. I have to implement the, the same. Uh, I want to move to the next section um, from business to mainly to the team and uh, I want to share the screen. Uh, I want to share the screen with your LinkedIn page. Okay. And okay. as I see, uh, Time Doctor team is all around the world. So it's like Time Doctor uh, people who work in. It's from Philippines, India, United States, Canada, Philippines as well. I don't know what is region seven. Argentina, Canada, Nigeria, Australia, Colombia. Pakistan, Melbourne, Australia. How do you manage that? So what's the strategy? So basically you mentioned that you have started the first company, it was totally remote. But as I see Time Doctor is like, it's quite a big company. You are able to hire like employees in Canada, I believe, or I don't know, or in on the United States. But why do you hire globally? What, why, why do you do that? And you work in different locations. So, and I believe asynchronically because different time zones. How do you manage right. that? Uh, very, very carefully. <laughs> so um, the, we're a remote first company. We have remote work, work philosophy and remote first work philosophy. So we believe that talent shouldn't necessarily be connected to a particular geographic area. Um, so that's, that's our generalized thesis. Um, in terms of managing that talent, realistically, if you have one to two hours of of overlap time in terms of being able to, to communicate synchronously, you can work with anyone anywhere. Um, boils down to very clear communication. So understanding that you have good communication processes in place, so you're reporting that information back to your direct reports well, and then secondarily process documentation. Uh, so you need to be able to take all of the processes that you have inside of your company and you need to be able to digitize them and put them up on some type of a cloud service to be able to, um, to allow all of your employees to have access to that information effectively so that they can manage themselves as opposed to you managing them. A fantastic example is if you go to about.gitlab.com slash handbook, uh, GitLab has all of their processes and their remote first company online and for free. And you can literally just do a, um, you can do your own repo of that document and edit it for your own purposes and use it. So those are the two critical parts, communication, documentation. If you've got those, then you can manage remote teams without any problem. It's interesting that 
you have like the mix, the low income regions, like, I don't know, like Colombia uh, or uh, Pakistan or India and high income regions. How do you pay? Do you pay like equally or you just pay the salary uh, which is good for the region? What's, what's the strategy? Equally, and then we just run a competition. So um, we don't, so we say, so we set the salary and we don't set the geography. So like as an example, let's say that we have uh, $60,000 to pay for a developer or seven, let's call it 70,000 actually, that would probably be a more realistic salary band that we would pay uh, for a developer. Well, then we just look at, look everywhere. So we probably wouldn't be able to afford San Francisco or New York, but we would be able to afford the Midwest United States, parts of Canada, uh, we would probably be able to afford most of Eastern Europe, probably actually a big part of Europe, um, Africa, Asia. And then we just say anyone that wants to apply from those locations can, and we just go through the process. And it's, it's interesting when you don't bias yourself by location, the talent almost always ends up not being located in the places that you would think. And we have employees inside of the company that are paid hundreds of thousands of dollars per year because that was the requirement that we had and we couldn't find that talent for a lower price point. And then we have people that are paid tens of thousands of dollars per year um, because that was the price that was effective for us to be able to accomplish the task. So my general feeling is the bands so just recently, Facebook announced that they're going to lower the salaries of remote workers that leave San Francisco. And I actually think this is such a huge opportunity for developers that are not located in San Francisco or New York, because we're going to start to see the disconnection of salary with geography, which I think is a bad, it, that's a bad correlation to have because it has no impact on whether or not you can do the job effectively. Interesting, and I just want to drill down. Uh, I will share the second screen. So it's uh, the location of Time Doctor Engineers. That's I found, that I just found, find out from the LinkedIn. So okay. it's five engineers from staff.com. I don't know if that's correct or not. It's Ukraine, Egypt, Sri Lanka, Turkey, and three engineers from uh, Time Doctor. Uh, and it's from India and Pakistan. Uh, yeah, probably you, pretty old. <laughs> I think this is, I think we're at like 30 right now, but uh, generally, yeah, I mean, we're, we're distributed everywhere. So we have, um, uh, like our, our product manager is located in Canada. Um, we have a whole bunch of people in Kiev, um, India, Pakistan, Ukraine. We have an office in Egypt. Um, Egypt, by the way, is a fantastic place, particularly not in um, well, north of Egypt, right next to Alexandria is a really good location for fantastic developers and Sri Lanka, Turkey, um, just everywhere on planet Earth. And we have two devs, I think, in the United States now as well. What is the regular like salary of the, if you have one and if it's, it's not a secret, for the developer at Time Doctor or staff.com over the engineer? Generally, I mean, the band can be anywhere from like 30 to 70 US. So 30 to 70 US dollars per year? 30 to 70,000 US per year. US dollars per year. Okay. US dollars, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's and, a lot of and, it, and it also depends on, you know, what the situation is, what they're, you know, what what kind of is that particular skill in demand uh, we would go higher in some cases but generally um, that's the band that we stick with again that's something that we really can't compete for San Francisco or New York salaries but I actually think that those salaries will I think that everyone going remote in San Francisco in New York in the tech startup space is probably going to result in um, the collapse of those salaries. Because there's been a very interesting problematic situation, which is if you're a very good developer and you 
want to get paid a lot of money, you have to move to Palo Alto in order to make, let's say, $200,000. However, a lot of friends of mine that moved to Palo Alto say, I had more free money living in Canada making 60000 as a developer than I am making 200000 in Palo Alto. So I think we're going to see a massive shift, and this is going to – the tech companies – in the in in the valley will recognize i would say within the next 2 years that geography does not suggest skill and therefore they will start to expand out their talent search to a much broader group and that group is as good as the talent in San Francisco but there's been a very problematic dichotomy suggesting that they're not and all data says that they are <laughs> very, very good at their jobs, um, as good as the talent. I would probably say 95% as good as the talent in San Francisco. Um, but is that, you know, is that the difference between double or triple their salaries? No, it's not. And that will all just adjust within the next few years. Just to finalize with the time, Dr. Holbeck is the time doctor right now. So you don't uh, show any numbers, but over says it's four million per year. Is it more or less? It's significantly more. Significantly more. So you yeah. built the business basically bootstrapped from scratch, and now you're earning from the SaaS business, which is launched in 2012, like more than five millions a year, right? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll tell you it's an eight figure business. Uh, we don't like to disclose much because we don't want to, uh, we don't want people to update this document. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want people to kind of know how much we're making because that actually puts us at a tactical disadvantage in the market. Um, but yeah, we're, we're doing quite well. Wow. Okay. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I want to move to the staff.com. Uh, when you go to the staff.com right now, it's just redirected to the timedoctor.com, but I know that it was like two-sided marketplace for the remote workers. Can you just yes. tell us more and what happened to the staff.com? Complete failure. Um, I, can break, I can break it down very simply. Uh, we, so we were running a platform kind of like TopTal, but we were providing the same services that TopTal is currently providing, um, but we were running an Upwork model, which is a bad thing to have. Inside of a two-sided marketplace, it's really important that the individual is not as important as the service. So when I get an Uber, I don't care that it's Andrew from Uber. I just care that it's an Uber. And what we were doing is we were taking a percentage. So we were taking 15% of um, an employee's salary. And we were putting in a very focused recruitment process into that model. So we were spending a ton of energy trying to find the right person for you, you know, spending, in essence, thousands and thousands of dollars in terms of labor on our end to be able to make that connection <clears throat> with that person. And the business first year was doing about 86,000 MRR. Uh, by year two, we were doing about 110,000. And we had 11% monthly churn inside of the business. And whenever I would call up customers about their churn, they would give me a whole bunch of excuses, which wasn't the real one, which was they were poaching that person directly out from underneath us. So they were taking that 15% cut. They basically said, let's work directly together. And so we realized that that was the wrong model and um, it just wasn't something that we would need a lot more capital in order to take it to eight figures as an example as a business so we decided to um, to can it so time doctor highly successful uh staff.com is still one hundred thousand dollars per month as an mrr but you decided to close it yeah and it was also in conjunction with looking at Time Doctor, uh, Time Doctor was growing like clockwork. And it was a SaaS business. So it's software instead of people. And I mean, you guys know at Six Nomads that like, 
th there's various problems managing people versus software. So we realized strategically, it just wasn't our time. And the, it, was the, it was really bad timing. And the core problem that we had inside of that business model is we did not recognize that a two-sided marketplace should not exist as a continuous relationship with a singular individual. And if you're going to run a two-sided marketplace like that, then you need to get that money up front in order for the model to work properly. Just to sum up with uh, stuff.com, what's the biggest mistake did you make with, uh, with uh, that product and what's... what's the... Secret churn. So poaching. Um, people will generally not tell you the real reason why they're quitting and you need to have some deeper conversations with them in order to really understand why they're quitting their service. So anyone, anytime anyone quits the product, particularly in the early days of a SaaS business or any business that's a recurring model, do whatever it takes to get them on the phone for 15 minutes and talk with you. So we have a very easy way of offboarding people. We ask this critical question, what could we have done to have kept your business? And because I'm stating it in the past tense, it lowers their defenses because they think, oh, well, I don't want to get on the call with Liam because he's going to try to get me to use the software again. And that's really not my intent. My intent is to be able to figure out what was the real reason why you quit. And the initial reason why you gave may not actually be the real reason. It may be a lot more complicated than that. And then once I understand that, then I can add that inside of all of our churn reasoning. So we categorize all of our churn and then break down, hey, you know what? It looks like if we add a payroll feature inside of Time Doctor, it's definitely going to reduce our churn by 10% as an example. And this is going to be worth X amount of millions of dollars within the next 12 months if we do it. Okay. Uh, I want to finalize with a running remote conference. Uh, I don't have any questions because I just uh, can give uh, the short, but I, I believe it's better that uh, you give the, say what, what it is, but that year the Ryan Remote Conference was totally remote, the first time on history, right? <laughs> sure, yeah, I guess we could say that. Uh, so, I mean, the Running Remote Conference, like all events, everything got shut down and we ran a virtual event um, and we lost about we lost about 150,000 plus on the physical event. And then we lost another 30,000 to run the virtual event. So, um, you know, for anyone that says that conferences are easy, they are certainly not, especially when COVID hits. But we're continuing on with that. So we're going to be implementing other strategies. We're running the, the next one, which is coming up June 17th. If you want to go and sign up for it, it's at just at runningremote.com. Um, and that we recognize that right now, as it, we believe that we could probably become cash neutral uh, just by running virtual events and primarily by connecting sponsors with attendees is the, is the big part of it for us. So we've been, you know, we've been focused on that. It's, it's a difficult situation because everyone inside of this, the, the conference space has been melted. You know, the, the space is 95% finished and it looks like we're probably not going to be able to get back to a physical conference for at least the next year and then possibly longer than that. So we have to figure out a business model in the interim, which is running these virtual events. Uh, they're actually pretty fun. And for us, it, it's a natural extension because we're talking about remote work, but it's yeah, not a business. We'll see how it ends up. I don't, it's I'm not a business. Sure. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Like I would probably say right now, the conference is on life support and I am feeding it an intravenous <laughs> amount of cash in order to keep it running. Um, and, and I just, I'm very passionate about remote work. So I, I'm happy to continue to, to feed it. But uh, it's, it's one of those businesses that I, my heart goes out to people that are running events and that's their primary business model because I think there's no way that they'll be able to get out of this, this model effectively. You know, most support your conferences that you're going to 
if you're going to do a virtual event, try to support them with sponsorship dollars or try to even support them with like a lot of them are running like a VIP tier, a paid tier. It really does help them. And if you want to see them survive and make it through the next year or two so that you can have a physical event to go to, it's really important to give them some money now. Thank you very much, Liam. Thank you very much for coming. It was a yeah. pleasure to have you. It was really productive. And thank you very much that you, uh, your answers were quite direct. So some people, when they ask, what is the salary? Is how much do you earn? They're trying to roll down and you are exactly direct. Thank you, you know, very much. We're pretty open. And yes. you did a lot of homework. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you very much.